What's Hot and What's Not in Google Classroom with Alice Keeler, Episode 607. Thank you, Discovery Education, for sponsoring today's show. At the end of the show, I'll tell you about two free contests for your grades, 5 through 12 students in the U.S., the Stanley Black & Decker Making for Good Student Challenge and the Sitgo Fueling Education Student Challenge. Stay tuned. The 10-Minute Teacher Podcast with Vicki Davis. Every weekday, you'll learn powerful, practical ways to be a more remarkable teacher today. Oh, today I'm so excited. We're talking with Alice Keeler. She is just one of my favorites because she just helps me all the time. And while she has many more things that she's an expert on, and I highly recommend her as an amazing ed tech trainer, today we're going to talk about what's hot and not in Google Classroom. Where do we start, Alice? Hey, Vicki. Thanks for having me on. I am a big fan of using Google Classroom, and I love helping teachers use it. So thanks for letting me do this with you. Let me just start talking about some of the new things that are in Google Classroom. And one of them is they have a grading feature. Now, to be honest, grading is one of my things, if it can be a thing. I love data. I'm a math teacher. And grade books have always been kind of a sticking point for me. Where did these come from? What is the history of grading practices? And what really motivates students? Well, I've done a lot of research on grading practices. And it turns out some dude at Yale made this up. And really as a way to sort and kick kids out. And it's not why we're doing teaching anymore, right? And so if we just historically look at practices, should we continue them? Are they good for teaching and learning? And I would say that we know that averaging scores is not good for teaching and learning. That's not good for motivating. It motivates students to maybe be compliant, but does it motivate them to really want to learn? Are we measuring learning? I was reading a great article by Cult of Pedagogy, Jennifer Gonzalez, today on retrieval, which is another thing on my list today, and uh, actually one of her other blog posts. I just was getting into her site. It's so great. When you look at grading, are you measuring learning? Are you measuring compliance? You know, why do we take late work? What are all the policies around it? And a lot of it's just based on historical habit. And so I would like to propose that we really rethink why are we doing something and what would help kids. So I look at the new grade book in Google Classroom. It is the most archaic grade book on the market. It is just straight up putting in scores. I can't excuse students. It actually takes quite a bit of time for it to load. So I'm kind of a little happy that it's so terrible because it allows us to have more conversation about what kind of grading practices we want to have. So what I do in Google Classroom is I use rubric scores. I do everything out of a four, and four meaning it's not even that uh, it's full credit. Grades in your grade book, you you know, a lot of schools can't even have that conversation. They have the grading policies. But what am I doing in classroom that encourages student learning? And so what encourages learning is conversation. This is just what I love, love, love about Google Classroom is that every assignment has a private comment. And so that I can take the focus away from the grade and put it on how do I... Uh, interact with students. And it's that interaction that's really teaching. It is. The interaction teaches and we have to take the time to make those comments. And I, you know, I don't really use the comment bank in there because I kind of feel like I need to put unique comments. Oh, thank you for saying that. And I try to always put their name too. When you say someone's name, you think you're so that you'll help remember their name yourself. But actually it's a psychological trick that they think that you like them. And so as I interact with students, I try to say their name as often as I can. And even when it's in text, I try to always type their name. So even if I do use the comment bank, I will edit it slightly to try to include their name whenever possible. Now we're all super busy, you know, that I have time to do it. I I would love to be super teacher, but I'd also love to be super mom. And I, I can't sacrifice spending time at home with my family just to do piles of paperwork, which is another lovely thing that I saw on Jennifer Gonzalez's website is how much are you grading? And I always like to say, stop assigning yourself so much paperwork. It's kind of a rookie teacher mistake thinking you have to grade or mark everything. It's really looking at how you spend your time. What's the bang for your buck? The return on investment of the time you spend versus how much uh, learning comes out of it. Absolutely. And I think I get the most bang for my buck by writing a kid's name and putting a personal note. But then it's just not a note. You know, they can reply back. I don't think there's another LMS that I'm aware of that has that feature. I think that's unique to Google Classroom. Trying to remember, you know, I've used some other systems that might be in there. But here's the thing is I have found 
a lot of interaction in Google Classroom at the beginning of a grading term. That back and forth conversation really pays great dividends later because they know you're there. It's almost like you have to say, okay, I'm here physically. I see you here, but I see you online and making that connection, you know, between our digital personas and our physical personas and realizing we're all one cohesive thing and we're in here learning together. That to me, you know, that handshake, that digital handshake is important when you do global collaboration, but it's so important when you have your bricks and your clicks because you got your face-to-face bricks and you got to have your online clicks and both are part of the classroom. Absolutely. And, you know, when we're using technology, we say, what is it that improves learning? Not how do I do what I've been doing digitally? We know what improves learning is those relationships, those interactions. And what we do know is that kids are more likely to ask a question if they can ask it digitally. So just the fact that you have Google Classroom available, some kids would rather die than raise their hand, right? They don't want to be singled out or they're embarrassed or they think it's only them. And so they can ask you that question privately on every assignment. So I highly encourage that teachers put everything, everything, everything everything in classroom. It can be marked as ungraded, but it gives the direction and then allows students to ask me a question. Best part, like hands down, forget even the rest of my life. Cool. So we have some hots and some nots. What else? Right. So one of the things that I love is to get everybody on the same page. Like why open up 30 documents when I can open up one? So I always encourage using one Google Slides and adding it as students can edit. The default is students can view. And I love that Google Classroom gets it. We shouldn't be assigning ourselves giant piles of paperwork. So the default is not make a copy. I try to avoid that like the plague, like 20% or less of my assignments are making a copy because I want to focus on interactions, not on doing paperwork. And anything you can do on a whiteboard, if it can be done on paper, it could be done in collaborative slides. Now, of course, that does take a little investment in practice. One time I got to sub The very first day of preschool, that was last year, I was dropping my son off at school and I I worked in the district part-time and the preschool teacher wasn't there that day. So I said, okay, I'll help out. It was the very, very first day. And some of these kids had never, ever been away from their parents a day in their life, literally. But the other teacher who was there, there was two of us, she's like, okay, you guys, we're going to line up at the door. How do you think that went? Uh What's a door and what's a line? Like herding cats, right? <laughs> I did, she didn't say, well, I tried that once and it didn't work. You know, she, like we lined them up again. It's almost exactly like that. Uh, having everybody on the same exact document, you're not born knowing how to digitally collaborate. It's something you got to try, fail at, do some reflection, do it again. And so one of these types of assignments where you get all the kids collaborating digitally on the same Google Slides or spreadsheet is you want to do it often. If you do it infrequently, it's not going to be very fun. But once the kids get the hang of it, and they'll get it pretty quickly. Today, I went to volunteer in a friend's classroom because they were doing classroom for the very first time with their students. And the students just were in it with almost nobody needed my help. I just, it was such a beautiful moment just to see how kids have really come along with the familiar uh, with technology, even though most of them had never used Google Classroom before. So that was lovely. And so. So what's next, Alice? What else is hot and not as we finish up? So as we continue to talk about how Google Classroom transforms what we can do, it's giving feedback during the process before it's due. As soon as work is in Google Classroom, I have access to it. So here's my tip. Don't release their score until they respond to your feedback. Actionable feedback that really improves learning. So I go in, give the students feedback. I'm not going to release their score until I've seen that they've made some improvements based on the feedback that I have. And then my last is... Google Forms. I love Google Forms. It's really the greatest thing since sliced bread, but is this really the best quizzing tool? It can be a great tool to use for retrieval, which we should all kind of check into if it can be more effective than regular study methods for retrieval. So you can use Google Forms for that, but it just requires so much clicking. And the way that it gives students feedback is it gives it at the end rather than question by question. So as I go into Google Classroom and I click on create and it gives me the option for making a Google Form quiz, I recommend you try something like quizzes that automatically connects to Google Classroom and imports the student scores and allows them to take it multiple times in a much more fun format with a lot less clicking for you. 
much, much uh, agreed. I used quizzes today and it just is a, it just integrates so nicely. So many things integrate so well with, with Google Classroom and just make it a superpower. So Alice Keeler, she's my go-to for everything Google. If I have a problem, I message Alice. And you know what the amazing thing is, and, and Alice can't do this for everybody. It's better just to follow her stuff and look it up on her blog. But there've been a few times I've had really weird things and Alice, you've taken the time for me. And I just really appreciate that. You're very helpful and knowledgeable, just uh, and you do great training. So thanks, Alice. Discovery Education has two student challenges happening now. The Stanley Black & Decker Making for Good Student Challenge runs now through Thursday, January 30th, 2020 for students in grades 9 through 12. This STEAM challenge invites students to design a blueprint for a product that could improve our world while following the six-step engineering design process. Learn more at coolcatteacher.com forward slash maker challenge. The SITGO Fueling Education Challenge for students in grades five through eight asks students to create a STEM solution to improve our world. They will make a short video sharing their sustainability solution and the process they use to create it now through February 13th, 2020. Learn more at coolcatteacher.com forward slash sustain. Students love an audience and love a challenge with cash prizes. And here are two fantastic challenges from Discovery Education. I hope you'll join in.